Hi, hello everybody and welcome back to another lecture in Geography 341 Weather and Society. I'm Dr. Zach Hilgendorf and in this lecture we start breaking into a little bit more of the fun stuff I think for, for a weather and society class. We're going to start talking about cyclones. Mid-latitude cyclones are where we're going to lead off. Uh, there are two types, mid-latitude, well two types that we're going to talk about, mid-latitude and tropical. Uh, this first lecture is going to look at mid-latitude cyclones. So these are cyclones that impact daily life around us here in the upper Midwest. Uh, tropical cyclones can turn into things like hurricanes, typhoons, cyclones, things. They're all the same term. So we're going to start here. Uh, we're going to learn all about what makes a cyclone a cyclone. But first, we're going to need a little bit of recap. I'm going to start, start off pardon me, by uh, recognizing some of the reference materials I used here. Uh, this was from Professor Ian M. Brooks, University of Leeds, uh, Dr. Eric Snodgrass, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and the uh, National Weather Service and National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I got a lot of good figures from all of these uh, aforementioned references. So big thanks to them. Uh, but let's go ahead and start talking about some of the things that we need to kind of recap. So if we think back to our last set of lectures here, we talked about fronts. Four primary fronts uh, and some kind of sub primary. We have warm fronts, so these tend to move slower than cold fronts, if we recall, out of the leading edge of warm air moving northward. Uh, before the front passes, winds are easterly. Cloud cover may be heavy ahead of the front with rainfall chances increasing as it approaches. Temperatures will warm rapidly with clouds clearing rapidly after the front moves through. With the warm air comes higher humidity as well. So here we've got this at mass uh, moving, in this case, from left to right. So as that warm front pushes over that colder, denser air mass, uh, you're going to see kind of those that transition from, because that gradient is so much more shallow than, say, a cold front, which we'll talk about here in a second, you see kind of stratus cloud formation, alto stratus clouds, nimbo stratus. So our rainfall is potential. Uh, and what you'll see that rainfall is usually as not very high uh, intensity in the in the case of you know like a cumulonimbus cloud you know, or anvil clouds that form oftentimes with cold fronts in the leading edge, uh, but more of your kind of long-term drizzles. These storms can span hundreds of miles, uh, and we see them kind of as this the you know leading edge uh, we'll say uh, as this front kind of pushes in. Cold front. Uh, is the leading edge of a colder air mass. Temperatures will usually change rapidly over a short distance. Also, there is a sharp change in moisture content ahead of the front and lower moisture behind it. Shifts in wind direction are significant in identifying a cold front. Thunderstorms sometimes develop ahead of these fronts as that warm air is forced up over a much steeper gradient between the differential temperatures and pressures within those two air masses. And that warm air is forced to rise rapidly, and as it rises rapidly, it cools. We, we you know, talked about this ad nauseum. Another type is our stationary front. Uh, this can be found uh, where you've got kind of stationary air masses. So you've got the, the front itself is stationary. The air masses themselves are mobile. Um, but neither the cold air mass nor the warm air mass is gaining ground either way. Wind tends to blow along this type of a stationary front in opposite directions on either side of the front. Conditions along the front are clear and dry. However, if moisture is available near the front, clouds and light precipitation might start to develop. And then an occluded front occurs when a cold front overtakes a warm front. In a cold occlusion, the colder air is found behind the front. Conversely, a warm occlusion is characterized by warmer air located behind the front. So those are our, the four types of fronts that we really talked about. So that kind of sets the stage for what we're going to go into next. Because if we look here at this, we saw this a couple uh, last week, I believe, or in the last set of lectures, uh, we see this area where we've got an occlusion. Uh, draw my little pen tool here. We've got an occlusion here where this warm front here has been overtaken by this cold front pushing in. And what are you noticing? Well, this entire area here is from, you know, basically that I have circled in the yellow and then kind of sketching out here, rain and thunderstorms. 
with rain outside, mixed precip outside of that. This is from November of 20, uh, November 28 of 2022. So there was some snow in the northern portions of the of the United States into Canada, uh, and then we had rain and thunderstorm possibilities along kind of the eastern half of the U.S. That is a mid-latitude cyclone formed very typically by that uh, kind of cold front catching up with the warm front there. Uh, it's a very low pressure zone. Let's go ahead and dive into what these are. So mid-latitude cyclones are low pressure systems uh, that are characteristic of mid-latitude temperate zones where we live. And really this portion, whether you're in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere, these mid-latitude regions, so think, you know, 30 to 60 or so degrees north or south. Uh, so outside the tropics, so 23 and a half degrees north to south latitudes, so outside of those tropics, but not fully poleward yet, so not past the Arctic Circle. So we call those the mid-latitudes. They form in well-defined zones associated with a polar front, which provides a strong temperature gradient and convergent flow resulting from the global circulation patterns that we see and we've talked about in the past. So here we can see one, uh, I'm gonna highlight a couple of things here. So this is a mid-latitude cyclone uh, that is starting to impact or is impacting the UK. And we see a couple things. We see kind of a stationary front on the leading edge uh, and then a cold front pushing in behind it. So here's our stationary front. I'm kind of drawing out here. Here's our cold front here, pushing behind. And notice that we have obviously some type of cyclonic activity. So in the Northern hemisphere, it, storms or mid-latitude cyclones like this spin in a counterclockwise direction. So they are spinning this way. Let's sketch that out there. In the Southern Hemisphere, flip-flop that. Just thank the Coriolis effect for, for these differences here. But as it does so, we've got this intense zone of low pressure situated right in the center of this cell. So you've got converging air that, as we've learned, converging air rises because it's warmer in the surrounding area. So as it rises, it cools. As it cools, it condenses. As it condenses, it forms clouds. So here you've got a particularly low pressure zone and all this air is funneling into the center to fill it. So let's go ahead and look at what a two-dimensional evolution of a mid-latitude cyclone system looks like. So in the first step, we have a low pressure zone that forms at the surface uh, over a polar front due to divergence of air aloft. So air is diverging aloft, converging at the surface. As rotation around an initial low starts, a wave, as we call it, develops on the polar front. So we've got air going this way, air going this way, this little kind of displacement of this front here. Friction effects cause surface flow around that low to converge. So now we're getting stuff kind of coming in to the same spot. If we recall when we looked at, pref or at uh, pressure a good number of lecture series ago, this is what we looked at. They're kind of flowing at uh, kind of oblique angles towards the center. So if we look at this from a mass balance perspective, inward flow is compensated by large scale lifting, cooling, and cloud formation. So those that air is lifting as it's flowing into the center. As it lifts, it condenses and forms clouds. And then those clouds eventually start to precipitate, right? This is kind of the basic formation of clouds and precipitation events in general, but this is the start of a mid-latitude cyclone. Next, that surface low is maintained or deepens, gets even lower pressure system, 
due to divergence of air aloft exceeding convergence at the surface. So we might have our high pressure zone up here. We've got our low pressure zone here. So this high pressure, because you've got all this air starting to funnel up, might become even higher. That air might start to really diverge out. And as so, you've got it, this air kind of still drawing up. This is even more vacuous here. So this is even more of a low pressure. That it starts to intensify as well. And as it does so, more air starts to funnel and filter in. So flow is what we call super geostrophic. So cold sector air pushes the cold front forward. Warm sector air follows up the warm front. So that warm front moves slower than the cold front, right? So here we see, sketch this out a little bit more easily. So I've got blue here. If we're looking at that top diagram, I need a different blue. There we go. So here's our cold front, right? We see the triangles there. Here's our warm front right here. Now, if we look here in that next one, the cold front overtakes the warm front to form an occlusion. So here's our warm front again. Here's our cold front where they meet. That purple there, that's our occlusion which kind of works out from the center of the cell. So the depression usually achieves its maximum intensity 12 to 4, 24 hours after that occlusion starts to form. So if you're looking at weather maps and you're kind of looking at a progression um, or looking at pressure maps and you see that occlusion begin at, you know, 0600 and, you know, 6 a.m. in the morning or something like that, you can expect that sometime around 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. of the next day, you'll have reached full intensity within that occlusion and within that cell. So it's kind of late stage. So where we just were, that was kind of like peak stage, that maximum development of that cyclone. Then that low starts to weaken as infilling air or inflowing air fills up the low pressure. We're starting to equilibrate again. So our low pressure zone isn't so low. So that cell starts to weaken. So then that high pressure by default isn't as high either. So you're getting less divergence aloft, less convergence at the surface. And then that low continues to weaken and the clouds begin to break up in our little sixth panel there. So that's kind of the two-dimensional uh, change. Now let's look at it from a three-dimensional perspective. So this is going to be a little bit different. So uh, same concept, same things happening, but looking at an oblique three-dimensional uh, view of it. So here we can see kind of that initial, I uh, don't want to use my purple there. Uh, we've got that initial dip, kind of that bend here where you've got your cold front pushing much more quickly ahead than your warm front, which is kind of slower over here. that front starts to overtake or the cold front starts to overtake the warm front. So you've got warm air, you can see uh, on all of these vectors here, warm air is rising because again, it's less dense than the surrounding air mass. So it starts to rise and condense. You get rain maybe starting to occur here. Here's what, if we were to look at A to B, that's what you're seeing here. So basically this cross section right here. So notice we're not kind of at the apex of this little bend here. We're a little bit back from it. So you've got that cold air mass, the warm air mass, so that cold air mass is pushing in. That warm air mass is rapidly rising here, a little bit more shallow over here towards B. Now, Stepping back a little bit more, uh, this is just a little bit further into the storm. We've got that occlusion starting to form. So now our cold mass here has overtaken our warmer mass. Here's our warmer mass. And here is that 
occlusion. You can see it right there. So there's our occlusion. And what we're starting to get now is that true cyclonic activity starting to form. So you've got the air moving that way. You've got the air moving that way. You've got air flowing up as well. So now you can see we've got two different air masses. We've got, if we look from A to B, we've got our cool air mass or our cold air mass here to this point. We've got a cool air mass over here to this point, and that warm air mass has been forced upward vertically. Uh, so it's being forced to rise. That warm air is condensing, providing tons and tons of moisture uh, to add to this rotating cell. And here we can see kind of this fully formed portion of the stage. So we've got uh, cyclogenesis or the, you know, the, the generation of a, a cyclonic system uh, here. You can kind of see it in that circle. Our cold air mass is pushing this way, still forcing that warm air above it. Um, we're getting towards the later stage of the cyclone here. So let's look at it in just one other quick way. So just a second three-dimensional view here. We can see uh, from polar front theory, we know that in, a mid, in the mid-latitudes, there is a boundary between cold, drier uh, continental polar, cold, polar air to the north, and warm, moist, or maritime tropical air to the south. And that's really the impetus for a lot of this development, is that difference between that cold, dry air and that warm, moist air. Along this boundary, a counterclockwise circulation can set up at the surface, which acts to take warm air up from the south and cold air down from the north. That's the process that we call cyclogenesis. So I will sketch it out here. You have to apologize that I'm using my mouse to do this. Cyclogen. Cyclogenesis. So genesis, the start of cyclo, a cyclone. Um, so here you can see, we, again, we've got that air kind of pushing in both ways. We might have our stationary front here that is starting to bend. We get that dip that we see right there. In the center of this circulation, there is mass convergence. All the air is moving towards the center of the circulation, much like when you make a whirlpool in a pool. Uh, all the leaves and all the stuff that might be floating in that pool start to move towards the center. Uh, when all that air hits the center, we've got rising air because it, it's basically got nowhere else to go. It's being forced upwards. If upper levels are favorable for cyclone development, then there's a region of divergence aloft above the developing low pressure center. This will help pull the air that's converging at the surface upward and continue to develop the surface cyclone. The upper levels also steer the system and make it progress east as we kind of mentioned earlier on. If levels aren't favorable for cyclone development, the cyclone won't grow and the mass convergence into the low at the surface will just pile up and fill in the low pressure system and it'll decay. If it is, then step two here. If the upper levels are favorable, then the mid-latitude cyclone will continue to develop and bring moist tropical air in the warm sector and bring down cold or continental polar air in the cold sector. Then the moist tropical air rises as it moves out ahead of the low, helping to deepen the low pressure center to the east and move it along. The continental polar air sinks behind the system and fills in the low on the backside, helping to move the system along as well. It's this transfer of energy that both strengthens and propagates the mid-latitude cyclone further along. Once the mid-latitude cyclone is fully developed, well-defined fronts appear. And we see those here, here, and here. As the mid-latitude cyclone reaches its maturity, the central pressure will be at its lowest, and the occluded front, over this way, 
will begin to form as the cold front catches up to the warm front. We've, we've talked about this, just reiterating and showing it in a couple different views. Um, once the system is occluded, all the warm air is, or basically occluded, once all the warm air is above the cold air, the mass convergence acts to fill in the low, and therefore the pressure increases in the low and the system starts to decay. So do we kind of got the general overview of how this functions now? So we kind of have this stationary front where we've got this cold, polar, and warm, moist air kind of meeting. And we've got this low pressure system in divergence aloft. And as that divergence intensifies, the convergence also intensifies and raises. You know, we have this mass piling up, forcing this warm air up. As it warm, as it rises, it cools, condenses, starts to precipitate. Oftentimes, you could see two different things. As we saw in that uh, some of the diagrams earlier, you might have, you know, along this warm front, maybe you've got kind of a longer term drizzle, and then you've got as that cold front pushes through, maybe a intense line of storms. So you can kind of have multiple things going on in these types of mid latitude systems. So if we were to look at typical winter patterns, for example, uh, and precipitation, winds, temperature fronts, and upper level flow and clouds, it kind of looks like this. So we've got, you know, in the upper level or our upper atmosphere, we've got uh, this, you know, jet stream kind of moving, meandering back and forth. You might have upper ridges, you might have lower troughs, and upper ridges, right? This kind of meandering flow here. What that leads to is high pressure systems near the ridge, low pressure systems near the trough. So that means you've got, we're a high pressure system here. You've got translating down to the surface on the back end of this mid latitude system, low pressure system, forcing air up to fill in kind of these, uh, low pressure areas in the upper atmosphere as well. So the general movement forces it this way. You might have showers here, increasing clouds here, falling pressure here and here. Precipitation in a big band over this way as well. If it's winter, you might have snow up this way. And then on the back end, you've got rising pressure and clearing skies. So it's just kind of another way to look at these types of systems here. So if we were to look at typical paths in a general North American winter, for example, it kind of looks like this. We've got low pressure systems over here, the Gulf of Alaska low. You might've heard of Alberta clippers or Colorado lows. Hatteras low and the Gulf low. So kind of showing the general movement of these mid-latitude systems across the United States. You can kind of see here by all these arrows. So on the lee side of the Rockies, downwind, um, lee means downwind, so downwind of the Rockies. Uh, you get lee cyclones, so these are what we call Alberta clippers. These are fast moving and typically carry little precipitation uh, because of their distance from moisture uh, for the most part. We've got Colorado lows, intense. These are intense lows with strong warm air advection in the warm sector, very cold temps in the cold sector. Uh, if there's a lot of Gulf Coast moisture, uh, Usually you'll see sleet, freezing rain, and rain within the warm front and strong thunderstorms within the cold front and snow coming in along the backside. Along the east coast, we typically see gulf lows. So these will form along the southern coast where there's a thermal boundary between that warm ocean and the cool land. Remember, water has a higher specific heat. We've talked about this before, which means it takes a lot longer for water to heat up, but it takes a lot longer for it to cool down as well. So what you get is basically 
that warmer air during maybe the winter time is helping fuel these storms even more because you've got that cold air mass hanging out over the land, warm air mass over the water, so that continental polar, that maritime tropic. Usually these have lots of precipitation because of their proximity to a moisture source. And then our Heteroslow and Nor'easters, these are the most intense tropical storms that form along that thermal boundary between the warm Gulf Stream and the cold Atlantic coast. They can bring flooding along the coast and a few feet of snow inland using the oyster, oyster, ocean as a vast moisture source. And these can develop what we call bomb cyclones. Now, this isn't meant to be a uh, kind of a dramatic word, but what bomb cyclones mean or bombogenesis occurs when a mid-latitude cyclone rapidly or explosively intensifies over a 24-hour period. Typically, but not always, acceleration, uh, they accelerate and strengthen over the ocean and central pressure within that cell, because these are dominantly low pressure systems, drops at least 24 millibars in 24 hours. That's the general guideline for the development of a bomb cyclone. And you can see uh, as this kind of starts to develop and we look at this uh, graphic over on the side here, I'll give it a second. Um, we've got, watch this air mass here, start to notice that, yeah, that cyclonic counterclockwise flow here. Um, so we're looking at water vapor. So notice uh, we've got tons and tons of water vapor coming in off of the Pacific coast with this system feeding in um, and also from the Gulf Coast as well. And we see kind of that defined circulation. I'll delete my little things there. Uh, defined circulation or cyclonic rotation uh, as it's moving over uh, like Arkansas, Nebraska, Kansas area, uh, and you know, starting off maybe over the, the Four Corners region or Texas area. So in particular, this cell, uh, we're actually going to learn a little bit more about here. So this was a bomb cyclone on the 13th of March, 2019, that had developed over southern Colorado. The record low pressure setting system two, 970.4 millibars. Uh, if we think of sea level, you know, 112 or so millibars. Um, this is pretty low as far as low pressure systems go. Gusts from 60 to 100 miles per hour dumped one to three feet of snow. 1,400 flights were canceled out of Denver International, waylaying 5,000 passengers. All major highways and interstates from Denver were closed. Multi-car accidents were numerous. 1,500 people were stranded in their cars. Trees and power lines were blown down. Almost 40 or almost 450,000 without power, and there was one known fatality as well. So these types of mid-latitude systems, while we typically experience them as drizzles, multi-day drizzles, or maybe a strong line of thunderstorms, can have incredibly devastating effects. So they can be potentially deadly uh, or destructive if we see that kind of bombogenesis, um, or if it's just a generally or particularly large system. So that's it for mid-latitude cyclones. We learned kind of how they form and develop from two and three dimensional systems, typical patterns, winter trends, and the concept of a bomb cyclone. So in the next one, we're really going to talk about the destructive storms. We're going to get into tropical storms, which can form things like hurricanes. So hope you enjoyed the video and we will see you in the next one. Thank you.